invitation uh, and thanks very much for sending me on a journey exploring Sir John Benson and um, I suppose as someone who's worked in looking at, at, at Cork history for, for over 25 years and different strands of it and, and enjoying that journey as well and um, I have to say the last two and a half months and kind of researching and putting together this presentation um, has been a lot of fun um, in trying to unpack um, what Sir John Benson was actually involved with. He's a name that one comes across quite often when it comes to architecture and industrial architecture and engineering in Cork. And um, but it's it's actually he's actually a person that I've never brought together all the pieces of. Um, now I'm going to come back to this gorgeous painting you see in this kind of uh, in this front panel um, as we kind of go on the presentation. And I'll actually also come back to this this gorgeous um, sketch of John Benson as well as we kind of go on and kind of put it in context and also try to put Etta's um, painting um, that she presented from the Crawford Art Gallery. Um, um, the the Manny painting in context as well as actually uh, as we go on. Um, go on there yeah uh, excellent um just a few opening mar remarks maybe to begin with um hopefully by the end of the presentation that I suppose the two words that will come into your head will be composite professional or certainly professional. Um, we're very, very lucky with, with John that we've a rich archival record of his core works that have survived. Um, each piece for the most part has has much written on it, um, but it's a very scattered record. I mean, there is no book on Sir John Benson. Um, there is no YouTube video on, on John Benson. Um, as I say there, um, Probably the the one place in the city which we'll be talking about later later on is the old Cork Waterworks experience that kind of has tried to bring together some of John's stories. Um, I will be talking about buildings and engineering. We don't have any of his drawings um, really that have survived um, in any great depth. Um, I'll be showing you spaces of of, of bridges like St Patrick's Bridge. Um, I we we have minute records of on of we say how many masons he worked with or how many other sub engineers he worked with. Um, but certainly he was completely involved with accelerating Cork's innovative and industrial side, the making of modern 19th century Cork. And his work is still celebrated today. I mean, many of his buildings, as Etta says in, in, said in her introduction, are celebrated today. And actually many of the challenges that faced John Benson still exist today. And we'll be talking about a kind of engineering Cork as well for the future as we kind of go along. Or you'll see these echoes in the present day and in the, in the future thinking of Cork as we kind of go along as well. Um, in terms of his backstory and where it begins, um, Etta kind of mentioned, yeah, we're not dealing with a Cork native, we're dealing with a Sligo native. Um, he's born in 1812, and that seems to be the only information that we have. Um, it actually struck me today that I, I, I hadn't researched was he Roman Catholic or Church of Ireland, um, and I actually still don't know, um, because most some a lot of the projects he's working on are a mixture of Church of Ireland and Catholic churches, which we'll be talking about. But certainly in the corner of the world he's actually from, I mean, Sligo, you're dealing with um, a lot of prehistory there in terms of Carrow Moor, um, and you're also dealing with a, a truckload of standing stones, um, the myth of the home of the Fina, you're also dealing early an early 19th century, you're dealing with uh, Anglo-Irish kind of Protestant gentry, and you're dealing with a lot of Irish Catholics working across some of the estates there. Um, and also when it comes to um, Kaluni, where he's actually from, it's just south of Sligo, um, and this is actually a northern survey map from um, the early 1840s, um, first edition northern survey of kind of Kaluni town. Now, interesting enough, um, I can't tell you where in the map he was actually born even, um, but interesting, the town itself has um, a set of bleach mills that were run by the O'Hare family. You can see these mills here. This is the um, the Onamore um, River, um, and you can see that it's it's atypical um, Irish town of its time. Um, a church, a church mill. Um, interesting. Um, those of you who've ever been researching kind of Cork history, this is actually very similar to set up and look actually to Douglas Village as it looked like in the 1840s as well uh, in 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 Cork. Um, but we do know um, from, and, I, and again, this information that I managed to, to mine down into is, is secondary information. I haven't actually found primary information on, on John Benson from this particular time. Uh, I've no doubt that I need to spend some time in Sligo Library, kind of digging down, digging down into this kind of Sligo landscape and where he was born and brought up. But certainly at the age of 21 in 1833, John Benson was sent by Edward Joshua Cooper um, of Macri Castle to a technical school in Dublin. And it's presumed that it's the Royal Dublin Society School of Architectural Drawing. Um, now, 
Um, Edward Cooper himself, he's only 34 years old. John Benson's slightly younger. Um, the picture on the right is actually um, Edward Cooper, actually, as, a, as an old man. Um, but Edward was an Irish landowner, politician, astronomer, um, was an MP, best known for his astronomy, creator of the Macri um, Observatory. Um, so here you go, here's Macri Castle. Um, so you can imagine John Benson as a 21 year old walking into this kind of, um, this castle. Now this castle was built on the site of an Anglo-Norman castle. It was added to over time. Um, but there are reasons why I'm, I'm showing you this because the, some of this, some of these images and drawings echo in some of John Benson's work um, as he really kind of gets going in his career. Um, so basically on the grounds of the castle had the largest reflecting, refracting telescope in the world. And um, it had actually discovered asteroid nine met Metis there in the 1940s. And um, so you now that's the, the observatory is, is something that um, John Benson would have seen on his visits to the castle to see um, Edward Cooper. Um, but basically we find that John's early work, so he comes out of presumably this architectural school in Dublin, um, with not on a major amount of kind of education and engineering. You, you can't say that oh, he was top of his class, but certainly seemed to be spotted as a very talented student. Um, so very much by his his mid to late 20s. Um, he gets one of his first commissions in the Church of St. Paul, a Church of Ireland in Colony in Sligo. Um, so working on um, design of transepts and kind of groin ceilings. Um, he's contractor for walls of two towers uh, of two lighthouses in County Sligo Harbour. Um, he's involved in a full design of the Church of St. Anne Strand Hill, Church of Ireland, County Sligo, the Church of the Assump Assumption, uh, Colony in County Sligo. And also he returns to the guy who, who kind of paid for him for his education Josh, uh, Edward Cooper uh, to, to superintend some historical works there, our conservation works. And then he's also involved in kind of the design of a, a Holy, Holy Cross or uh, RC Dominican uh, building in Sligo Town itself. Um, so what do these kind of look like? Um, so here's his first kind of project. He's working on transepts and kind of groin ceilings. Um, so 1837 to kind of to 1843, he's kind of, this is in his own town. So he's getting work where he's actually, where he actually kind of grew up. Um, I don't have an image of the lighthouses that he was involved with. I only actually have um, this kind of ardent survey map from late 1800s. The two lighthouses actually haven't survived in the present day. They, they were actually amalgamated into one lighthouse. Actually, time, time goes on in Sligo Harbour. Um, this is... Um, Another one that he worked on 1843 in terms of the full church itself. So you can see the high spire, um, high transepts, um, and actually the buildings of Ireland and the Church of the Assumption. And um, so it's 1843 um, Roman Catholic Church said this lofty church was designed by local architect Sir John Benson. It boasts very fine stonework, exhibits skilled craftsmanship, and its treatment of stained glass, internal joinery work, and mosaic um, walling. So keep in mind this guy now is um, he's 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 still quite young, he's in his early 30s, um, but, it, but it seemed to have a very a good eye for things or a great eye for things. This is just another one of that, that he worked on the same year, um, Church of St. Anne Strand, Strand Hill in County Sligo. And also from a very early age, he's working on multiple projects, um, which is something that when he gets to Cork City, he's also working on multiple projects that, that cause problems for his health as kind of time goes on. But certainly he's, you're, you're, we're dealing here with a, work, a workaholic um, is, my, is my gut feeling. Um, this was something that you can see that is here on the on the right, the Friary of the Order of St. Dominic. Um, unfortunately, this church um, was replaced in 1970 following a fire and as a modern church now in Sligo town. Um, but you can again, I, there are there is a reason why I'm kind of saying to have a look at the towers and the minarets because you, you, you'll see this design coming popping up in some of his churches that he was involved in in Cork City and when, it, when he arrives into Cork City um, itself. Um, and also was involved in the replacement of an, of an existing skew bridge um, in 1846 in the middle of Sligo town. Um, and this is just an Im two images I actually um, took myself actually way back a few years ago in, in Sligo when I was there passing through. Um, but it, it opened in 1846 and there was a collaboration project with a gentleman called Noble St. Ledger. Again, there's a reason for I'm showing you these because these are going to echo in designs like St. Patrick's Bridge, which we're going to kind of talk about later on. Um, but certainly this is one of his last projects in Sligo before he moves to Cork. Um, so this guy has an interest in working with stone, um, has a lot of experience in churches, um, dealing with river projects, harbour projects, bridge projects, general interest in infrastructure, and then seems to pick up a very important job 
um, in Cork. So 1846, so probably just finished the Sligo Bridge and was appointed as County Surveyor for the West Riding of Cork, but was immediate transfer to the East Riding, a position which he held until the 24th of March 1855. Um, now, the East Riding of Cork is absolutely enormous. In one sense, on this particular map, it's a line from the northwest of County Cork, maybe um, just maybe south of kind of Ballin College and, and to the harbour and everything east. You're dealing with um, Cork Harbour, um, places like Castletown Road, Tradcormac, Fumai. It's a vast um, amount of land. Um, it probably has similar difficulties to the West in terms of topography and its layout, um, undulating the river valleys um, and trying to work with that. And a county surveyor involves kind of laying out kind of new roads. Also, 1846 is probably ringing a bell, which you're going, he started his job just at the start of the Great Famine. And yeah, you would be right. So from 1846 and 1847, in newspapers such as the Illustrated London News, images like these begin to appear. This is done Manway Town uh, in 1847. Uh, and basically, he chats a lot to um, a guy called William Augustus Tracy, um, who's in charge of the West Riding or the Western part of County Cork. So William and John B., they were actually, they were met or their job uh, as in their first two years was with the demanding task of super in superintending famine relief works. Um, so we're dealing with, I mean, these images are right across the Illustrated London News in 1847. Um, so the, the potato blight itself, um, people flocking to the workhouses, so the workhouse in Cork City, for example, which opened in December 1841, um, by the height of the Great Famine in 1847, was hosting 5,000 people, it was four to six people sleeping in a single bed. Uh, I know of a walking tour of the old workhouse, um, which is now St. Finbar's Cathedral, kind of our St. Finbar's Hospital site, um, and elements like that. Um, we're also very, very, we're, we're lucky that we have things like the Atlas of the Great Famine, those books produced by Cork University Press that kind of map population change. So you can have to imagine like um, John Benson on the eastern side of the county and William on the, on the western side of the county uh, and very much pinned to their colour going, well, you need to create these famine relief works and work with the poor law unions um, at the time who were championing these, these um, relief works where people would work on a road or a bridge and then kind of get, get paid a little bit and get, get a little bit of food at the end of the day. Um, nothing kind of major. Um, we are very, very, it's, it's interesting with John Benson. Um, I kind of said at the start that it, I don't think anyone's ever really had trying to pull all the, the information on them together. And we're very, very lucky in the world that we live in that things like the Cork Examiner is now digitized going back to, to 1841. So you can kind of Google in the sense John Benson within the Irish newspaper archive and come up with all these different references. So this is actually interesting um, on um, June the, the, the 4th or the 5th, 1847, there was a dinner given to John Benson um, by the civil engineers of the city and county of Cork. Um, so Engineers Ireland Cork, um, their branch way back in 1847. Um, and they're basically 35 gentlemen, you can see here in the centre column, sat down to dinner in the capacious coffee room of the what's now the Imperial Hotel, uh, which was served up in Mr. McCormack's usual good style of comfort, elegance and abundance. Mr. Richard Barry filled the chair and Mr. Richard Brash, who was an other architect in the city was the vice chair. Um, an appropriate address was read by the vice chairman from the engineers of the city and county at large um, in order to testify to that gentleman the high estimation and affectionate regard which he is held by members of the profession. The address was accompanied by a service of plate. So he was kind of, he was given a silver plate uh, in the heart of the great famine. Down the right here you can see some of the reply. Um, you seem to forget, so John Benson standing up in the Imperial Hotel in 1847 kind of says, dear friends, um, you seem to forget that any success with which they may have attended to, tended is to be attributed more to the efficient manner in which I've been supported by you than to any extra exertions of mine. Um, and then there's the last paragraph, and the calamity that required such exertions can be allowed to pass away and our official connection shall cease. I hope still to retain the personal regard of men who acted so nobly as you have under circumstances the most, most trying. Um, um, no, and he, he does also comment, um, the, the engineers at the time comment about this distressing calamity here on the left, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that as, as it was noted at the start, this, this, um, and this will appear in a YouTube video, so you'll be able to kind of like to, to, to pause this like as in, in the weeks to come and kind of read some of this stuff in more detail. Um, but we do know that in John Benson gives another report and um, 1854, and it gives us more of a sense of, well, what exactly did he do um, during the time between 1847 uh, and 1843? So first of all, um, 
these are, again, this is from the Cork Examiner in 1854. So he said there are 200 miles of roads added within the last eight years to the county, which previously were repaired, repaired by turnpike trustees. So he's making roads um, public. And um, he's also saying that he's working on an extra 125 miles um, of roads, um, of county roads to make sure they move away from turnpike roads. Um, and then he's also adding, he, he's got a plan for 300, 325 miles of roads kind of post, post that. Um, but he's also saying that in 1853, and he, he, he kind of mentions that um, there was this huge um, flood in 1853, um, where there were 46 bridges carried away by the flood, and his job is to repair them. Um, and as well as that, he says that contracts, so just here on the left here, contracts have been prepared for the rebuilding and repairing of 24 of them to begin with. Uh, the opening of the tenders for the rebuilding of the large bridge across the Blackwater at Ballyhooley uh, will be your first business uh, order today. But he also says that there's a problem. Um, that some of the contracts that he set out, especially for um, road repairs um, and bridge repairs, it says up here, on some important thoroughfares, the contracts have been taken at less than half the amount necessary for their maintenance. The consequence has been that they're almost total neglect by the contractors and great inconvenience to the public. So people were getting these contracts um, at half price, but not doing their job in a nutshell. And he's also, he also comments about diversion issues, contractor shortcuts and so on. So his journey between 1847 and 1853 is actually interesting and we also kind of get insights um, again from um, some of the work already done on him um, in the past now this is one of the bridges he was involved in designing Lee Mount Bridge um, which is kind of at the intersection of the uh, the, end, the top of the straight road as it kind of meets Ballancolic and um, kind of area and kind of going out into kind of Blarney Lee Mount area and um, so this is actually a map it is a section of a map from again from Arden Survey in 1840s uh, and on the map it actually says um, road in progress and i can tell you as well if i actually showed you the straight road it says road in progress as well so john benson basically was involved in creating i suppose the straight road what we know today um, and also a road into Lee Mount Bridge to give access into um, a, a road that was going to um, Tripsey, Coachford, and kind of also kind of onto Blarney area. And um, so that's kind of that's just one interesting example of something that he was worked with, work, working with in terms of a road and the bridge. Um, you know, one could go on and on in terms of you see Carragrahan Castle there and the story of Carragrahan, and you'll see there's a the flour mills and all of that there all for another day. Um, but in 1848, um, so so we're going back, kind of, I'm not going to jump around time, but um, but 1848, um, on the 31st of May, um, he gets a new job. So apart from being like surveyor of county roads of the eastern section of Cork County, he's consulting engineer to Cork Harbour Board. Now, the Cork Harbour Board is interesting at the time, um, like things like Spike Island Convict Station had just opened. You can see this in the sketch here. This is a sketch from like the 1840s, um, actually from the Crawford Art Gallery collection. Um, and that had just opened. Um, also, they were one of the problems with Cork Harbour that began to emerge in kind of late 1840s. There was this huge demand for for emigrant ships, and many of them actually couldn't get up as far. Some of them were quite large and actually couldn't get up as far um, as Cork City itself. Um, so he did some work. So I've got another. Um, so when he got that job, um, he was involved in. Um, looking at the harbour, um, developing piers around the harbour, particularly places like Lingaskiddy, um, Monkstone, he's also involved in dredging projects, um, also involved in a, in a thing called, in a Spitbank Lighthouse, a place called Daunt Rock, which is a few miles off Roach's Point Lighthouse. But this is actually an image, again, from the 1840s and illustrated from the Illustrated London News showing, um, you see the Cove of Cork. Um, shortly after this image was actually taken, um, it was going to be renamed Queenstown after Queen Victoria's um, visit um, there in 1849. Um, but certainly this went from a sleepy backwater um, through John Benson's work and also Lord Middleton's work where they laid out more streets and actually also put in, we say, a deep water dock actually here as the 1850s went on. Um, so you end up something, with something like this. This is actually John Brannard's image of Queenstown in 1860. Um, now this image itself. Now you'll you'll see that if I went before, like I mean these buildings that I, you see here um, are still there 
um, in the 1860s. But you can see that the image itself is putting a focus on there's a new dock down over here. The pier has been developed a lot more down, uh, around over here. The streets have been kind of laid out a little bit more um, and also kind of new buildings kind of going up the hillside a lot more as well. So there's a lot more investment coming into Queenstown area, 1860s, 1870s in particular, and all because of like John Benson's work in the harbour and trying to develop a kind of a deep water area um, especially from eight, kind of 1850s kind of onwards um, and also then he's appointed 1851 appointed engineer of the city initially under the to old title of surveyor of the county of the city of Cork so what does that mean for John he's got four jobs um, east riding so the eastern part of Cork county um, the harbour uh, and also the city, uh, and also he's a private works consultant. Um, so not only is he ba he's balancing these say four to five projects at any given time, uh, this is a major workaholic. So this is actually a lovely image by Thomas Roberts um, from the Crawford Art Gallery collection. It's an image from 1790, and it's actually a colorized image of a, black, a lovely black and white plate that Thomas Roberts actually did. I think this, color, this was colorized as time went on. But this is probably the world that John Benson was dealing with. So he got this 1851 job where now he's got the city um, under his his, um, under his belt. Um, the city at that particular point in time had an, a, an enormous um, exterior dock called the Navigation Mall. Um, and he did what well, John Benson was involved in doing a lot of kind of dredging work with the Cork Harbour Board and kind of dumping a lot of the material behind the navigation wall where the cursor is actually here. In time, this navigation wall became a, a gorgeous private walkway um, called the Marina, um, the Marina Walk, which is in our time. You can see that the, um, the early origins or the early St. Patrick's Bridge, which was built in, the, in 1787, 1788, um, is within the image. And you can see it's a kind of a, there's a glass works over here you can see Shandon um, and I just want to go on a little bit I mean it's, these paintings you could give a whole hour just on the difference on what's what can be seen in these paintings what the artists are trying to do to do this is another gorgeous image by 1850 and this is very much the world of John Benson um, very busy a lot of steam um, steam engines um, a huge need for uh, for piers for docks in the city to cope with extra shipping dealing with a, an enlarged population of 80,000 people um, 150 years previously you're dealing with like 20,000 people uh, people are flocking into the city to make money also in 1850 you've got this huge legacy of the great famine as well I can tell you between 1850 and 1870 like 250,000 people um, left spaces like this and Cork Harbour and key exports butter and beef um, we'll, we'll talk about butter in a second and there was a clear division between the classes middle classes are living in um, areas like black rock um, and sunday as well uh, growing areas like montanati and then you've got huge slums off places like shandon street and barrack street um, which are all kind of talks for other times as well but just to paint a kind of a, a, a picture um, he's a city engineer so i actually picked this up in um, in, a, in, in a book in um, a public record book on public health um, within Cork City and County Archives, which is the, the, the duties of the city engineer in the mid to late 1800s. So, so apart from being involved with the harbour, looking after the harbour and dredging and piers and so on, he's also involved in looking after the proper maintenance of streets, um, the opening of streets for drainage, houses unfit for human habitation, markets and other buildings, works at cemeteries. So cemeteries at that particular time would have been St. Joseph Cemetery would have been the main cemetery at the time. Carrying out public, uh, carrying out a public health acts. Um, we do know that by 1880, the city engineers has actually uh, passed his time. Uh, he was long gone, but they were paid 500 pounds per annum. They had an office, fuel and light was included. And also they were kind of going for not more than 45 years of age uh, in terms of age. Um, at this point in time, I suppose John is, um, uh, I suppose he's in his early 40s. Um, he's, 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 quite, he's still quite young um and has but has a lot of experience kind of clocked up um we're very very lucky i mean when i say like that he's 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 looking after public health and um, this is one document that actually has survived in cork city and county archives um which is um, an order by john benson uh to the owners um of um 93 and 94 south main street that the wall between their property is dangerous and needs to be fixed and all and, th and this for me is where you um you get the 
you get John Benson's signature and his writing. Uh, and I actually did discover other um, letters written by John Benson as well in Cork City and County Archives in the last few weeks. His writing isn't the best, as you can see. Um, and when he wrote letters, he, there are a lot of them in kind of in shorthand. Um, so it, sometimes it's hard to, so when the, let, the letters that have survived, it's hard to decode them, to be honest. And we do have a letter on the Athenian, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but again, it's just very difficult to decode. So you can see this is October 1867. Um, this is one of his first consultants projects in Cork City, which is the Butter Exchange Portico. And of course, if you ever go to the Portico today on the on the ground underneath the arch, you can see 1849 uh, inscribed on it. He was also involved in kind of creating um, the Firkin Crane, what's now the Firkin Crane building, but the Firkin Crane is a weighing place for butter. Um, it's now a, um, the, an Institute of Choreography and Dance, that renowned institute up in the in the Shandon area. Um, but actually this, this, this building um, used to mark the site of a castle called Called Shandon Castle, um, that you and, uh, and before Shandon Castle, there was a ring fort called Shandun, our old fort. So hence the name where Shandon actually comes from. Again, a talk for another time. Um, but interesting enough, um, and thing that John Benson was involved in the city, the Illustrated London News seems to pick it up and kind of do something on it or do do a spread on what the building looks like. So here you go. Here's 1859. This is kind of 10 years after his work. And it's from the Illustrated London News. And it's actually an image of inside the butter market, which is quite a, it's, now this image, um, you'll find this online, it's quite a, it's a, it's a popularized um, image. Um, but of course, uh, if you were a butter, uh, a butter merchant, you arrived in your heart, horse and cart, you kind of gave in your firkin. Um, there was no name on the firkin itself. Um, there was just a marker or a number really. And then all the firkins were lined up. And then the following morning, um, and an inspector had to taste all the butter, or butter in all these um, firkins, and then they were actually all kind of stamped, then kind of giving you say a grade of, of first to sixth. Um, you now, interesting over here, it seems to show maybe the outside where the portico may have been. Um, so you can see it's, it's quite an elaborate building, um, but you can imagine your sole job every day is to taste all the butter row after row after row after row. Um, and actually, after every two years, um, you have to give up this particular job if you're an inspector. So there's junior inspectors and senior inspectors. Um, and if you were caught collaborating with a but, but, butter merchant, your name was just plastered across the newspapers at the time. Um, so that's just a, a side nuisance. Uh, and of course, they we're very, very lucky with the building today. Um, and Cork City Council are working with the Shandon Area Renewal Association to create some, some sort of innovation lab, perhaps, um, on this site today. When I say innovation lab, that's question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, and what that may actually look like. Like, um, but let's kind of go on. Let's just go on a little bit. This is probably the second of his commissions in a very short space of time. He was probably working on this when he was working on uh, the butter market portico, to be honest. Um, but the North Cathedral is the fifth church on the site. Um, 1820, an immense fire damaged the Fort Cathedral, uh, and, and the bishop at the time, John Murphy, um, delegated to a, um, an architect at the time, George Richard Payne, um, who again wasn't from Cork. He was actually from Limerick, uh, to rebuild the cathedral and the foundation stone of a new tower was laid in 1850. And it's said that John Benson was involved in the design of the tower. Um, but the thing is, is that the tower and kind of the revamp of the cathedral, um, it went all the way from like 1850 uh, through 1869 and actually beyond into the 1870s. And I can tell you by the 1890s, the minarets on the top hadn't been added yet. And my gut is that the minarets were an afterthought because it is said that they're 10 feet higher uh, on purpose than the adjacent Tower of Shandon. Um, it's like religious kind of rivalry. Um, so he didn't see this all the way through, um, except that he did have this kind of tower in mind, we say John Benson. So you can see this is very similar to some of the Sligo works, his earlier works that he actually was working on. Um, and this is another, this, and you'll see this, this is another one that he was working on St. Vincent's Church. Um, the design of this began in 1851, uh, Bishop William Delaney, um, um, laid the foundation stone. Um, it was finally opened in 1856, but I can tell you before it opened, there was a huge storm in 1853, um, which damaged the building um, highly. Uh, and John Benson actually did step away from the project because in 1853, there were other things happening, which we'll talk about in a second. And it was actually George Goldie uh, and Samuel Hines that actually took over the project. The original plan, um, I have a feeling that George Goldie and Samuel Hines kept on um, the idea of putting a tower on St. Vincent's Church, 
Um, but I have a feeling that as, as time went on, the tower element was actually taken out. I think a lot of it due to costs. Um, like the Roman Catholic community didn't have an enormous amount of money after the Great Famine. Um, so I'll give you another example of that. There's supposed to be a tower, a huge tower on St. Peter and Paul's Church. And they got rid of that because they had no money. The, the, the Tower of Holy Trinity Church, even before the famine, is another great example. The tower was supposed to be taller than what's there now. They just had a lack of money. Um, there seems, seems to be more investors coming from the Church of Ireland Protestant community in the city at the time, maybe, than the Roman Catholic class. Um, that's kind of my, my reading kind of of the situation, even though the Roman Catholic class, after the penal laws, really did really well for themselves. But again, that's a talk for uh, another time. Um, so just to go on a little bit, this was supposed to be the original plan uh, for St. Vincent's Church, so, um, but all of the tower was taken out and all that's left is um, this kind of section over here. This building is now part of the School of Music in UCC, um, but this is like um, what was supposed to be there, but as I said, it's supposed to be based on kind of John Vincent's kind of design. Um, so then we get this huge shift um, somewhere in this, the early 1850s where he seems to be Quite, he's well regarded. We, we, we know that from his work in the county and also becomes well regarded in the city. And his next project was the Cork National Exhibition. Um, this is, there's a lot of kudos that actually comes with this. Um, on, on, on this particular um, project, um, it leads him kind of further out of Cork um, after the particular project. But um, I've done a lot of work on the exhibition movement in Cork. Um, given talks and research over over the years, I just find it fascinating. And um, but basically these international exhibitions and selling your wares and promoting like raw materials and machinery and manufacturers, and um, they very much kind of took off in France in the first half of the 1800s. There was this huge um, exhibition in the Champs Elysees in Paris and covered more than five acres of ground and like four and a half thousand exhibitors. And it really ignited other countries to do more as well in, in promoting what, what was going on in their country. So this is actually an image from the Illustrated London News of this 1849 Paris uh, National Exhibition. So you can see like wall to wall paintings and sculptures. This is actually their fine arts hall. Um, and there's a reason I'm showing you this because I'll be showing you the court context in a second, which is also wall to wall paintings um, as much as possible. And the Paris Paris impetus um, inspired um, the German, uh, Bavarian government, Belgian government, Spanish government, um, and also um, the UK as well began to hold these national exhibitions. So 1828 onwards, it holds its first national exhibition. And I can tell you as well, the RDS in Dublin uh, began to hold trade bazaars from 1827 to 1849 onwards, but nothing to the scale um, what the Paris International Exhibition of 1849 um, actually put on. Um, but like I suppose the, the, the English government at the time and those involved in the manufacturers and industry um, were not put off by um, what Paris produced. Um, they actually approached a man called Joseph Paxton to create this great exhibition of the industry of nations in 1851 and like over six million people visited. So what am I talking about? Well, this is the magnificent Crystal Palace. It's a magnificent kind of Crystal Palace. Um, this is an enormous undertaking. So it's a mixture of kind of glass and iron. Um, you also, this is just some of the views in the Illustrated London News. Um, no, again, one could give a whole talk on this this alone, but this is this is inspiring people in the UK and in Ireland to do something similar. So one eminent Cork merchant, a guy called Daniel Corbett, and the editor and proprietor of the Cork Examiner, John Francis Maguire, they go out to the London Exhibition in 1851 and they, they come home going, we should do something similar in Cork and in terms of promoting Munster industries and manufacturers. So they um, they went to the mayor and the mayor, mayor of the city, um, James Lampkin. They said, look, this is a really interesting idea. And the idea took off. Um, and John Francis Maguire um, said, look, this was going to be a triumph of a prosperous economy over poverty, miser misery and associated issues. Now, keep in mind, this is 1852. Um, like the country and certainly Cork hasn't recovered from the Great Famine. Um, but this is kind of to, you can see here, to stimulate the artist to a severe study of his possession, inspire them to greater feats in their art, uh, to inspire fields of ideas and skills and uh, manufacturers and so on. Um, so basically, there's, a, there's an exhibition committee actually set up. Um, there's an appeal sent out, look, look we need money. Uh, and John Benson is, is chosen as architect. Um, the finance came from different kind of viceroys of Ireland. There's a Lord Clarendon, Lord Eglinton, who financed the initial and funds. So Eglinton Street is in Cork is named after this Lord Eglinton. Um, National Steam and Railway Companies facilitated transport requirements of the committee, providing free transmission of all articles. Uh, and also £100 is also donated by Prince Albert to this kind of Irish 
private undertaking, uh, just to throw that in as, as well. Um, the site of this Cork National Exhibition was going to be an old corn market site. Now, this corn market site was developed in the 1830s um, on the site of a marshland called Slays Marsh. And the building was going to possess... Um, so basically, there was a building on the site. And basically, what they did is that they, they, they built the corn, the National Exhibition behind the building. So you can see there's, there's some rounded buildings here, which I'm going to go into kind of more detail. Um, this new gallery was going to be roofed with glass, was deemed as having an appearance of being light and graceful, um, which is which kind of alludes to Etta's points as well um, in, in, in her um, introduction. Um, so this is before the exhibition. I could tell you, I could tell you be, be before the corn market or behind the corn market, there was usually a cattle show held by um, the Cork City and County Agricultural Society that in time became the Munster Agricultural Society. This is where they held their shows first before they moved to um, the show, well, I suppose the former showgrounds and the marina site and now out to Curraheen. Um, but here is actually an agricultural show, a cattle show in 1850. Um, so John Benson kind of come up, comes up with a design uh, and basically he gets rid of the cattle market site really, this rough ground and kind of develops um, um, an enormous kind of space kind of jutting out from the old corn market into the yards behind. So here you go, here's creating his new Southern Hall. And so this is from the Illustrated London News in 1852. I think one of the reasons the Illustrated London News that show this image um, is that before the hall was completed, um, one of the beams collapsed and there was a health and safety issue and the Illustrated London News actually reported it. And um, so you can see this is kind of made out of timber um, for the most part. Um, and so let's, let's go on a little bit. Um, so then they, I mean, originally the, the project was supposed to be local in na nature and they changed it to national in nature. Um, and I talked about a rope support breaking, crash to the ground, unfortunately no one was hurt. I need to tell you that what was kind of eventually kind of created this kind of hall was put together in 25 days. So they got the materials, they put the materials in situ and they built it in 25 days which is incredible uh, in terms of what they're trying to do with their time. So here's the corn exchange in 1850. Here's a map. Now we're really, really lucky. Like we actually have the catalog from the exhibition in 1852. So you can actually, in one sense, you can map where everyone was from, all the exhibitors. But again, that's probably a talk for another time. I just wanted to zone in on kind of John Benson. Um, but here's kind of the Great Hall before. So this is kind of the corn market. And then there was some sort, there was... Uh, a kind of a concert space and an art gallery kitchen bar something really really small john benson kind of kind of is sent in to take over the space and the area kind of where this, this total area is kind of marked here as well and so basically here's the after so he puts in a new southern hall a kind of a new eastern so it's like before after so you can see the annexes are put in and um, they're expanding with say the reception halls an antique gallery a vestibule um and uh, they're very much encroaching into the yard that used to hold those cattle shows uh, in a nutshell if that actually makes sense um there is a comment in the illustrated london news that apart from the great hall of westminster the southern hall at the time was deemed the largest room between britain and ireland what john benson actually created which is a, which is a great accolade to get um there was the, these huge processions through, through town um, um, now, I should tell you that when you start reading into the, this national exhibition, it's it is highly politicized. It is about like Ireland standing its own two feet. Two feet. Um, it is a sense of like commenting on an early form of kind of home rule that, yeah, we can be aligned to Britain, but we can also stand on our own two feet. Um, so you'll notice like even this, this image from the Illustrated London News, um, you'll see the signs for like to Australia, these immigrant signs and sign up to as an immigrant here. They're put to one side. Uh, like the, the sketches that the Illustrated London News are publishing are, are highly politicized. Um, here's another sketch. Um, now I'm, so, I'm showing you all this because John Benson's also part of this world. So like God saved the Queen, but then behind us like Aaron Gabra. Um, so I, all this stuff you can really kind of read into a lot more. Um, so let me kind of just go on a little bit. Um, then they opened the exhibition. And again, we have a sketch of the opening. And the seats were limited. Ladies holding season tickets were given preference. There was a throne for the Lord Lieutenant around which was arranged members of the corporation and other municipal bodies of the city all wearing their robes of, of office. So there was massive pomp and ceremony. The Southern Hall was filled to capacity. Now, basically, um, I don't want to go into much details, but if you just want to watch the black dots here. So the Northern Hall was devoted to textile fabrics and the Western transept was furniture and upholstery. Um, the Western compartment, carriages, saddlery, leather, carpetings and products of the poor law union workhouse. 
Um, the Eastern transept, the miscellaneous variety of articles, nearly every shopkeeper's craft was represented here, glass, stonework, cutlery, optical, surgical instruments, ornaments of all kinds, book binding, and so on. Um, there was also an Eastern transept, machinery of the larger and heavy, heavier kinds were put on display. Now, you're probably looking at this going like, does these, these look like small spaces? They were small spaces. Um, this wasn't an enormous building by any means, um, but certainly they packed in so much into them um, and give, a, give an idea of what was happening in the Munster um, area. Um, the Southern Hall of the, um, or the Fine Arts Court was works of national sculptures, painters were displayed, jewellery and silver work and more costly descriptions of furniture were also um, exhibited there. Now, how do we know all of this? Because I said the catalogue is published. It's actually available in Cork uh, in local studies in the city library. You can turn the pages and see all the different exhibitors and where they were from. I haven't done a full mapping yet in terms of a map showing where everything was from. I have done it for later exhibitions um, and we'll get to maybe comment on those in a second. So here's an image from the Illustrated London News. So this is actually looking out towards the quayside um, in a sense. So the front door is kind of at the end of this archway. So again, it's, it is like the, um, the Paris International Exhibition. Um, but a Cork version of it in terms of um, different paintings kind of put up and so on. Um, and this is also a kind of a concert space kind of um, uh, producing um, music of the time, fashionable music at the time. And also like what I call Irish national airs um, that kind of made a point as well. Like so even the music was politicized. So it's a really interesting time. It, was, it would have been a very, I would love to go back on a time machine and just and, and walk through it. Um, and again, we're very, very lucky that Cork City and County Archives also has this like Cork National Exhibition file. And this is another image actually, um, probably looking in from the quayside in and looking at a huge organ at the back. Uh, and you can see this gorgeous ornate fountain. Um, and that kind of leads us nicely into Etta's contribution at the start in terms of giving you context to that, that James Manny at the time, um, maybe he was there or maybe he was drawing from, um, I think this was drawn in 1852. So it does look like that James was present at the time. Um, this does look like the opening of it uh, in May 1852. Um, the crowds, kind of, uh, the crowds, and so on, is looking towards um, the quayside. I'm looking out towards the quayside, and you can see as well that James has, uh, has put a focus on the, the amount of light actually coming in. Um, and you can see, yeah, there is an official title: uh, National Exhibition of the Arts, Manufacturers, and Products, Products of Ireland. But when you're researching this, it's just Cork National Exhibition, and um, that actually comes up um, on the back of this. Um, and actually, Etta mentioned it, mentioned it in her introduction. Um, like the exhibition lasted for six months. Um, everybody was thrilled with it. It was such a, a great success for Cork. Um, and then there was this kind of project the Royal Cork Institution kind of proposed. Now, um, I've done a, again, I've done a book on the Royal Cork Institution. Um, and they, they, again, one could give a whole hour on who these guys were, but basically they promoted lifelong education in the city, science and technology classes, botany classes. And um, they had a main premises on the South Mall um, up in Jameson Row opposite the Imperial Hotel. Um, and basically, they championed the early origins of what's of Queen's College Cork, which is now kind of um, UCC. And actually before they kind of finished up um, the Royal Cork Institution, um, they also had an interest in technical education um, and some of their I suppose their youthful generations or generations afterwards in the 1880s, 1890s were campaigning for a technical um, institution in the city. And in time, we did get a technical, a technical school and in time that became CIT, which is now MTU. Uh, and so a lot of so there's a lot of echoes coming from the 19th century that are reckon, right into the 21st century. So it is said that lock, stock and barrel, the Southern Hall was brought from the Cork National Exhibition and put onto uh, Nelson Place, uh, which is now kind of in a place next to uh, an old custom house at the time. So this is a lovely painting by Samuel MacDonald, um, which is in the Crawford Art Gallery collection. Um, my gut is that, I mean, I, I showed you the skeleton of the Southern Hall, um, and it's quite a basic skeleton. I mean, what the, the, the Cork Athenium itself, uh, yes, probably one part of it had part of the Southern Hall, but they would have had to add immensely to it and put in a proper roof and so on. Um, so that's important to tell you that. And again, that was actually opened and it hosted a number of uh, important concerts. I can tell you in the early 1860s, Charles, Dick Charles Dickens actually read um, some of his works actually here. Um, there's quite a popular venue, but by, by the 1870s, the interior of it, of it was completely revamped. Uh, in the late 1870s, and there was a theatre company set up. It was called Cork Opera House Company. It had a board of directors, uh, and it developed a, a series of um, three-tiered um, 
tier, so a ground, a second balcony, a third balcony, um, and a stage. Um, I actually have an image of it, actually, of, of home. I should have actually thrown it in to show you, showed you actually what the original um, opera house was like, but again, it's for another time. We're just passing through some of these actually works. Um, so here is actually the opera house, we say, around 1910. Um, and of course, Etta in our presentation said that this kind of old opera house with various parts of the old Athenium um, burnt down in 1955, was rebuilt and opened in 1965. And of course, we have the present day building um, today. So it's the Cock Opera House in 2021 and with its, with its, with its, with its facade um, today. Um, a few years ago, I was involved in, in, in penning a book on the history of Cork Opera House with Alicia St. Ledger. And again, it's got a really interesting story about how the Opera House came into being and what sort of work they did within the Athenium to revamp it into the Opera House and so on. And um, so, yeah, that's a story for another time. Um, but John was very, uh, I think John's hard work really kind of paid off. Um, I think there was certainly a number of people that came down from Dublin um, that actually saw his work. Um, people like William Dargan, who was involved in developing railway lines kind of further up the country, saw his work um, and actually invited John to design for the Dublin International Exhibition um, of 1853. There was rivalry as well between the cities. Um, I can tell you that like, yeah, we had one in 1852, Dublin had one in 1853. Dublin had one in 1882, we had one in 1883, and it goes on like that um, even into the early 20th century. There's a, um, just rivalry by a second city such as Cork. Um, but basically there's a huge financial contribution of William Dargan, and this is John Benson's plan. Um, and we're very, very lucky as well. The Dublin, Interna the Dublin International Exhibition, um, this catalogue actually is in local studies in City Library as well. And again, you can go through it, you can see all John Benson's designs and plan. We're lucky to have such um, very, uh, just a great local studies, great archives, a great museum as well um, in, in, in Cork. Um, but this is basically a huge extension of the, of the, of the RDS in a nutshell. Now let me kind of, what do I mean by a huge extension? So here's a map. Um, so, or actually, no, this is actually Kildare Street. So it's um, so actually, it's the Royal Dublin Society House. It's on Kildare Street, and you can see the extension itself. Um, it's probably nearly twice the size of the of, of the original building. Um, this is made out of it's, it's glass and iron. Um, again, um, I've no record. I've never, I haven't come across records of well, who was John Vince? Who was John working with? Um, what sort of iron ironwork companies was he working with? We know in Cork there was only like three to four companies, nothing major. There would be many more, kind of maybe seven or eight in Dublin at the time. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of John's interior work. This is actually from the catalogue that was produced in 18, 1853. Um, and interestingly, it does look like James Manny's painting as well. Um, but you can see this, this is just one of the halls. So there were three halls. There's another one over here, another one over here. These, these are just enormous creations from a great mind, a great imagination, um, such as John Benson. Um, but let's pull the story kind of back to Cork. Um, and 1854, so um, he's just kind of after working on um, the Dublin International Exhibition. And out of that, actually, he's knighted. And he meets Queen Victoria, who's, who, who went to the Dublin International Exhibition, has an audience with her. Um, and um, I think we have the script as well um, of what, what sort of conversation um, happened between um, John B uh, and Queen Victoria. Um, I didn't throw it in because I've, I have so many slides I'm trying to get through. But um, again, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a big piece of work to be done and kind of bringing together some of this into some sort of publication um, in the years to come. Um, but 1854, the tunnel, so we're talking with the Cork Dublin Railway Line. Um, before the tunnel was created, um, the Cork Dublin Railway Line kind of stopped at Kilbarry in the Blackpool area. So 1854, I think the tunnel was completely bored through. Um, and then they had to open the kind of the, a brand new terminus um, on the quay sides in Cork at Penrose Quay. Um, what was created and designed by John Benson it was really, really interesting. It's 20 Doric um, columns, the foundations themselves, the foundations for this railway station that were 600 beach piles kind of driven into the ground. Um, it didn't survive the test of time because Kent Station um, kind of replaced it. But let me tell you, here's what the original um, Cork Dublin Railway Terminus actually looked like. Um, now, if you go looking for any of this today, especially any, any of this, these lovely, these 20 portico Doric uh, columns and so on that don't exist, what does exist today is part of the building over here, part of the railway station as well, uh, that we'd say the, where the trains pulled in does exist, and you can actually see it as part of um, 
the Penrose Quay um, works um, today. Um, I think it's one of those outstanding places where they're still working on um, to, to do a conservation project actually on, but this is all gone. Um, this is now a, a public square fronting onto Penrose Quay. Um, but interesting enough, from this particular project and this sort of intersection with the River Lee and Penrose Quay itself, um, John kickstarts a discussion. Uh, this actually appears in the minutes of the Cork Harbour Board minutes uh, across various newspapers at the time in the 1850s and 1860s on the future of Penrose Quay and its ability as a jetty for, for hosting large scale steamships. Um, plus, he begins a discussion on the need for a £5,000 of investment into the regeneration of the city's keys and the creation of new keys such as Victoria Key in 1862 by, by, by John himself. Um, so it is interesting how one project leads to another project um, and kind of sparks off something in John's mind. Uh, one can say that places like Penrose Key and what we see today and opposite in terms of Victoria Key, um, they were designed by John Benson and driven from an early stage. Um, now we do know by 1870s, 1880s, and um, there were other key sites kind of constructed kind of lower down um, as the river kind of meets the tide a little bit more towards the marina. Um, I don't know how much John Benson was involved in, in creating some of the key walls in, in, in Cork up the North Channel and up the South Channel. And we know something like six or seven miles of these lovely gorgeous parapet walls. I don't know to the extent he was involved in that. I have a feeling there were other sub-engineers in the city involved in that. Again, we need more work on who these people were, how was John Benson interacting with them and so on. Um, but he was also involved in, he also began work on another railway project, which is the Corkham and Croom railway, railway Line. Now, there are books written on all these railway lines that are in, again in local studies, but he proposed the Corkham and Croom Direct Railway Line. So this is a very much him kind of stepping up to the plate and um, this was it was incorporated in 1861 um he was involved with a guy called sir john benson who would have been mayor of the town at the time at, at the time and a guy called jo joseph renane who was a very well respected railway engineer at the time um he initially proposed it um but by the time it was kind of opened in 1866 he was still involved but not to a kind of a major extent i think the company that was created to host the cork and mccrumman railway company they, they they had got it they were they were developing it it's a five station line the 37 kilometer track and the line cost six thousand pounds per mile um you're probably asking where is all this money coming from um it's coming from um westminster or it's coming from a philanthropist in the city um we do know for example 1850 um the Cork Black Rock and Passage Railway Line opened, and I know initially they sought um, 100 people to give 100 pounds um, to kickstart the investment project into that. The same with the Cork McCroom Railway Line, the same with the Cork Dublin Railway Line, and other railway lines as well that were actually built um, in Cork at the time. Um, but here's actually an image from an Ireland survey map um, in late 1800s, just showing the railway line. I've, I've actually drawn a red mark over it. Um, I mean, there's there's one thing. Uh, let, let me kind of go on. Here's the railway stations itself. Um, you can actually the railway line um, followed an old kind of country road, and you can actually so it's a back road behind Ballin College um, into Columny, Kilcray, um, and onto into kind of Crookstown kind of area. And if you ever drive that road, this kind of back road, it's fairly up and down. It's fairly undulating. You'll see remains of some of the. Uh, um, the bridges that were kind of constructed over undulations and river valleys and so on. I mean, the the, the last map here actually shows the, the Bride River Valley kind of cutting through that space as well. So it's not like a straightforward thing to engineer, um, but certainly it was probably much better trying to engineer the Cork Dublin railway line. Um, he also then um, was in, this is actually the opening of the Cork and McCroom railway line in 1866. So you can see like the Illustrated London News, like John, um, so he's getting a lot of like UK coverage, which is helping him as well, kind of get more work um, and more an avalanche of work. Um, so now this line actually ran all the way to 1856 uh, and was closed because of the lead hydroelectric scheme actually flooding out, um, I suppose, the western portion of the railway line. Um, and I, I, I know earlier on um, this year, uh, engineers Ireland Cork actually had a talk on um, the ESB hydroelectric scheme. And I know they're going to put that up on YouTube shortly and you can learn more about that hydroelectric scheme and what it destroyed and, and elements like the railway line and so on. Um, he also also dabbled in the Cork and Limerick Direct Railway, um, a 25 mile line connecting with the Great Southern and Western Railway Line and Limerick and Foynes Railway opening in 1862 and dealing with a capital of £133,000. Um, so you can see he's working with 
um, a bigger amount of investment um, than some of his projects in Cork. Um, and then, meanwhile, in the city, so he's out designing all of this, he's hit with this conundrum, the Great Flood of 1853. Um, it, takes out not only bridges in the county it said i mean i said at the start it took out 46 bridges in the county of cork it took out one of the main main bridges in the city which is saint patrick's bridge um and that, this is just a quote from the illustrated london news um the excessive rains which this part of the country has been visited added to the violent hurricanes in the southeast which prevailed on tuesday in both acting an unusually high spring tide produced the most serious of floods this is an image appearing in the illustrated london news of people probably in rowing boats and places just like, I don't know, Half Moon Lane, Paul, what's now Paul Street area. Um, so fairly severe uh, and probably as severe as what we have had in Cork in 2009. So here's the Illustrated London News image of Parkins Bridge after the accident. So basically what happened is that water built up at, at um, North Gate Bridge, which was an arch bridge. And then all of a sudden the water was catapulted over the bridge and swept down and actually hit this bridge at force and destroyed many elements of it. Now, not completely fully, but damaged a lot of the foundations um, of the bridge itself. Um, as I said, the bridge had been built in the 1780s. Um, and actually when it was opened or halfway built in the 1780s, it was hit by another flood and they had to rebuild it again. So um, it had this history of uh, unfortunate news. Um, and this is interesting that um, John Benson is approached to do two things. One is to inspect the bridge, and then he had the conundrum of, look, the bridge is closed, how are we going to get over the river? Um, so basically, he embarks on a project to create a temporary bridge. Um, and this is actually, you can see here, the 9th of December, 1853, um, as Cork Harbour Commissioner is at their offices, Thomas S. Reeves is in the chair. Um, and basically that uh, the thanks of this board are due and are hereby offered to Sir John Benson for the energy and professional talent which has been exhibited by him in the construction of the Benson Bridge, which has been completed in an extraordinary short period of 18 days. Um, then he's pulled before um, Cork Corporation, some of the members of Cork Corporation. Um, there's a man called Mr. Edwards at a meeting who said, I examined Patrick's Bridge on Saturday. I think the foundations can be secured. I don't think they're in any such, uh, such a very bad state. And Sir John Benson retorts, have you ever seen to what extent the excavation under the Mere Pier has gone? I am as anxious as anyone could be to restore the bridge, but a mi misapprehension has gone abroad that I've given an opinion with respect to the bridge. I have given no opinion about the bridge as to whether it could be repaired or restored. Since ever I came to Cork, my object has been to save the public expense. And my object in ask asking Mr. Edwards those questions is the same. I fear that under the South Pier, if you examine it, you'll find that the bed of the river is taken away at the foundation to the extent of three feet below it. I went accompanied by Sir Robert Kane under the pier near next Patrick Street, and I was able to sink the staff six feet under the foundation on that side and under and, 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 and the other three feet. So this is a gentleman like who he talks back when he wants to talk back, and that was going to cause some problems um, in the in the in the few years just after this, in the short few years where the corporation members begin to kind of question his work as well a lot more. Um, so let me kind of go on. Um, so eventually, um, I'll get to St. Patrick's Bridge, but in the meantime, his two jobs are amalgamated. I mean, basically, there was this review of this 1853 flood uh, and the Cork Harbour um, and the, the, the two posts, the Cork Harbour and City Engineer jobs were amalgamated. And Benson was elected to the new post of City Engineer, which he held until um, 1873. Um, so let me kind of just go on a little bit. I need to... But here's 1859, the, the laying of the foundation stone from the Illustrated London News of St. Patrick's Bridge. Now, if you're good at your geography of Cork, you'll see St. Patrick's Hill here um, in, the, in, the, in the background. So this is kind of like St. Patrick's Key, beginning of kind of um, Camden Key actually over here. And you can see them kind of lowering, lowering in the foundation stone and people on barges. And, the, and what's interesting, like you, again, you can see this kind of mixture of an Irish flag and the Union Jack. Um, so again, there's like this, this, there's a political commentary in these images from the Illustrated London News as well. Um, but let me kind of go on. I should tell you the contractor was Joshua Hargrave, the grandson of the Hargrave that worked on the first bridge. Um, and this is actually just a close up of that. You can see the foundation stone going in, which is on the St. Patrick's Key side as I put in the foundation stone. And we're also very, we're, we're, we're in luck. I mean, here is Sir John Benson just here on the left. Uh, and actually he's standing in front of a guy, Sir John Arnott, the mayor of Cork. He was mayor three times, quite a popular man. Um, Sir John Arnott was actually knighted on this occasion for his work. 
um, and also this particular point in time were brought into the world that um, John Benson actually was a member of the Masonic Lodge in Pucky Street. And this is actually a, an image on the walls of the Masonic Lodge in Pucky Street um, showing Sir John Benson um, at the foundation stone of the bridge. Um, and that's where I actually got the image from. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to see this, this, this gentleman and this, this, it is like a, a photograph as well. And you can see John, Sir John Arnott as well, kind of over here on the left. Um, now, we do have loads of accounts by John Benson reporting to the Corporation of Cork on kind of like, well, how, how is he getting on? Um, and I'll just give you one account. He said the amount of rubbish taken out of the old foundation was 753 tonnes and 76 tonnes of old materials have been removed. He also gives a sense of that there was 228 days work done by masons, stone cutters, carpenters, smiths, helpers and others. One thing that we don't really have is his relationship with masons um, in, the sit in the city. I haven't come across it yet, but it's probably out there. His relationship with quarrymen, with labourers. You can see here that labourers spent... Um, 2,588 uh, days. Now it doesn't tell you how many laborers, just tell you the amount of kind of days they worked on it. Um, so that's just to point that out. And we are also very, very blessed and that one of the first photographs ever taken in Cork that has survived the test of time is sitting in Cork Museum. And it's actually the, the reconstruction of St. Patrick's Bridge in the summer of 1861. Um, so this is actually good to know. And of course, with St. Patrick's Bridge, it was revamped again uh, two years ago. Um, and of course, there was a lot of history that came out on the bridge at that particular point in time, and a lot of lectures given as well. But here you go. Here's probably one of the first photographs that were taken um, in the city. And of course, the Illustrated London News also go to give it a spread uh, in terms of what it actually looks like. And so I'm, I'm nearly there. Um, and this is St. Patrick's Bridge in the, uh, the early 1900s. Um, I did mention to you that Northgate Bridge was the only structure to remain standing while the 1853 flood swept over the city centre. Now, this bridge was constructed in the early 1700s, this, this gorgeous arch bridge. This is an image from the Crawford Art Gallery uh, from around 1790. So basically water built up on the bridge and then catapulted over the bridge, um, kind of destroying, and, and then the, the, the fast rapids created by that kind of did a, did a lot of damage. Um, well, basically, he, he, he basically builds a new bridge. Um, so he comes up with this concept based on my gut is actually bridges in Dublin at the time, where if you had just if you had one arch bridge, uh, you can cope with the flow of water a lot more instead of having this kind of build up and these series of arches. Um, so I'll probably skip over this a little bit, but in April, April 1863, the foundation stone for Northgate Bridge is put in. Um, and that's just important to tell you that. Um, and here actually is a, it's a postcard image of the bridge that was constructed um, in 18, that was um, opened in 1863, 1864. Um, and this bridge actually lasted 100 years and was placed by the present day um, uh, bridge you actually see today. Um, but I did tell you that his work probably was inspired by bridges in Dublin. So this is actually the former Victor Victorian Albert Bridge in Dublin, which opened in 1858, and actually a nod to upstream near Euston Station, present-day Euston Station, the now Sean Euston Bridge, where the Lewis passes over, opened in 1828. So these are like he's not, John Benson's not coming up with ideas for bridges that. Um, haven't been spoken about before. I mean, the uh, the King's Bridge, um, now Sean Euston Bridge, I mean, it opened in 1828. Um, so these are these these concepts have been around for quite a while. Um, and also he was involved in this controversial project um, called the Cork Water Supply. Um, so basically in 1855, only a select amount of people in the city actually got pumped water. Um, we do know in 1878, uh, Nicholas Fitton was elected to carry out construction work needed for a new uh, water supply plan. And the pot water was then pumped um, from kind of the Lee Road um, to the city to the city centre through wooden pipes. Um, so basically John Benson was approached, can you do something with this? And th this was an enormous project for him to take on. And again, we're lucky we actually have his reports from 1855 when he's when he he uh, on kind of what he was actually proposing. Um, again, this is probably a 20 page report, which I don't have a chance, won't get a chance to go into. But basically, um, Cork Corporation get funding from Westminster. They get 20,000 pounds to upgrade the Lee Road waterworks. Um, his plan was circulated to several eminent engineers in London for, co for consultation. Um, he, in 1857, the tenders were issued and the cast iron mains were chosen to replace the wooden pipes. They were initially shipped to Cork in 1857 and then the pipes were laid down uh, and then actually new reservoirs were actually created. Um, 
And the interesting thing about um, this is that I suppose some of these these cast iron mains I'm talking about are the, the things that Irish Water are dealing with today as they're putting in the new trunk mains across the city. Uh, they're dealing with John Benson's works um, from the 1850s. His works basically lasted um, all the way to the nearly the present day, um, but now have to be replaced um, to provide a better quality of water supply. Um, so these are actually all sketches from um, that I've, I, I kindly got from the old Cork Waterworks. So if you go to the old Cork Waterworks, there actually is a very interactive exhibition on John, John Benson's um, Waterworks plans and how he put it together. Um, now, the thing is that when he actually, um, I suppose he also put a chimney in place. Um, when he originally opened it, he put in an engine house, which was too weak to pump the water up into the reservoirs in the hills of the city. Um, and he was very much castigated in the corporation. So I told you before that he did take some councillors to task in the council chamber, and some councillors then took him to task when this didn't work out for him to begin with. So they didn't have to put in a second stronger engine, which was completed in 1868. Now, if you want to learn more about this, talk to the fantastic Mervyn Horrigan and his team up at the old Cork Waterworks. The, the tour there is very worth while actually taken, and you can really get the sense of John Benson's passion for this waterworks project as well. But ultimately, this sort of jarring with Cork Corporation a lot more his employer. Um, where he's thinking like this guy has done so so many works and and, and has spoken his mind um, so this is actually just a cartoon version from the old from the uh, old cork waterworks experience today but if you want to as i say take the tour and learn more about his, his involvement with that um things that people also attribute john benson to was the revamp in the english market uh, in the 1860s uh, where the, the the mayor at the time actually that you shouldn't read lord mayor should should read mayor um was kind of rebuilt by Thomas Walsh under the direction of architect Sir John Benson. So he basically designed this gorgeous red brick um, Princess Street facade and also the fountain inside. Unfortunately, the English market inside had two fires in the 1980s, so much of the old stuff has been destroyed. But we're very, very lucky to have this gorgeous facade um, that has been constructed. Um, another project he worked on um, was actually on the, on the gorgeous Berwick Fountain, um, which is named after Sergeant Walter Berwick, who came to Cork to preside as a chairman of the quarter sec sessions. Walter Berwick was known to be a common and um, um, popular man and came up with an idea of a drinking fountain and gave money for a drinking fountain. Cork Corporation kind of said, yeah, we can go along with this idea. And Sir John Benson was given the honor of designing the fountain. And he took six months to come up with a plan. The original plan was to have a gorgeous garden around it, um, but the garden was thrown out because of you have to employ a watchman to look out over the garden. And also there was this gorgeous plan as well to put a, a statue of a boy at the top of the fountain. Uh, and the water supposed to come out of his mouth, not out of a rusted pipe. So the fountain actually is kind of unfinished and, and maybe will never be finished. Um, but it's just to, to mark that. So you can see here like the old and new. Um, and just to go on a little bit, um, he survives the chop door um, from Cork Corporation uh, and he's involved in um, the creation of a new cemetery. So he said to part of his job is looking after the cemetery. St. Joseph's Cemetery fills up during the time of the Great Famine. And in 1866, he's tasked with finding a new space. And so he sends out a call for um, spaces in the city um, and in the town or, townland of Farnda um, Hador, um, or what's now Wilton area, a landlord actually comes forward. And he's got a lands that are a little bit of marsh land, commoners land, nothing kind of major. Um, and so basically the cost will be 600 pounds for the occupying leaseholder to take over this land and 125 pounds for the tenant who was growing crops on the site. And so it's 15 acres. And so basically he lays out um, two chapels, um, um, a registry building, and also a mortuary building at the end of it. And he bases the whole thing on Glasnevin Cemetery. This is a mini Glasnevin Cemetery. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we're very, very lucky that, uh, I'll just go on a little bit. Well, maybe I'm not, because I really love St. Finbar's uh, um, Cemetery. Um, but, um, so here you go, here's the Central Avenue. Um, now, I should tell you that this was a mixture of Protestant and Roman Catholic um, plots at the time. Um, and then um, a quarter of the entire new cemetery space was to be the allotted burials of persons of the poorer classes who couldn't afford it. Two thirds of the cemetery were to be reserved for Roman Catholics and one third for Protestants. Um, the two chapels he built, one is a Protestant chapel, one is a Roman Catholic chapel. They're both locked up and they seem to be relatively safe in terms of they're OK inside in terms of conservation work or dampness. We do need to find a use for them as my gut as time goes on. 
Um, but there is a plaque up on the wall saying um, Sir St. Finbar Cemetery established by um, the Corporation of Cork opened January 1868, Francis Lyons Mayor, Sir John Benson Architect. It's actually on one of the entrance gateways into one of the chapels. Um, here's the registry office, which is a gorgeous building that John designed. Um, and here's a plan I found um, within actually um, Cork City and County Archives. Um, so you can see the, the green part um, is for Roman Catholics and the, the, the orange part in this plan is for uh, the Protestant class. Even though if one goes and explores the cemetery today, there's, there's been many extensions to it. And my gut is that if you go into some of these plots today, there's, there's a mixture of classes as time went on and people began to kind of, um, uh, I suppose, intermarry with different classes and, and as time goes. So it's, it's a lot more balanced today, um, but it's a really interesting space um, that John actually was involved with. Um, and probably two or three, just two more of his projects he was involved with kind of going towards his retirement and death. One was a Theatre Roy, Theatre Roy rebuild. So basically, I mean, apart from the Cork Athenaeum in 1867, there was a theatre um, on um, Georgia Street and all of Duncan Street. Uh, he did work for a man called R.C. Burke. So he basically revamped the whole cathedral, um, new entrance doors, pit extended, uh, new stalls, new gallery, um, trying to host b b between 2,000 and 2,500 people, um, dress circle up whole street, three tiers of private boxes, raising the roof by eight feet. Now, there's one thing saying that, but again, we're very lucky. The Illustrated London News give us another sketch of what is the revamp. So here's the revamp. So here's the celebration of Illustrated London News of Benton's work. Um, now today, this is mapped by the GPO. Um, so the GPO kind of bought, so 18, like 1867 was the revamp and by 1877, so 10 years later, it's taken down. Just the inside of that theater from the Illustrated London News. Um, and then, yeah, he was also involved in the Cork Black Rock and Passage Railway Line in, in, in a move. Um, so basically, um, if I show you kind of what happens, um, so here's a map of the railway line itself. Um, so when it left the, its Cork terminus, um, it, it began its line actually along the docks and then actually went down the marina and then lost itself in the Black Rock cutting. So John Benson was commissioned to move the railway line um, to the south here. Um, so basically because all this land here was part of a race course and they didn't want a railway line going through the race course. In a nutshell, that's actually what happened. Um, so I'll just go on a little bit. Here's actually a, a picture of a train passing that particular site. This is Victoria Road over here. Um, so this image is around kind of 1900s. Um, we also have him involved. So this is actually a re the original um, station that actually was by um, the docks itself. So basically this station actually closed and he was involved in the redesign of a new station on Albert Road. Um, and eventually this, this building is now completely gone today. There's now a, a red brick wall here. Um, there's just nothing to say that there was a railway station there, um, which is basically the the first railway station terminus to be built in Cork as well. Um, and so basically what's left today is kind of um, Cary's tool hire, tool hire now have some of the space today. This is going to be revamped under under a, a new office block um, further over by the Sextant Bar. This building is going to be revamped and these buildings are going to be revamped as well, the old station itself. Um, and so basically let me just go on and this is one of his last projects um, with Henry Hill, um, the design of St. Luke's Church, the third St. Luke's Church in, um, in St. Luke's. Um, and again, I, I, I think he very much resigned before this was even built and constructed um, and very much ill health got to him and he resigned and a year later um, he was dead in terms of John Benson. And then we actually have his obituary notice in the Examiner and in other newspapers. Um, and it just goes through some of his early career from Colooney, uh, born 1812, um, comparatively quite a young man who was appointed county engineer to East Riding. Uh, and then the conclusion to the obituary is, in truth, he undertook too much. And many of the adverse criticisms he had from time to time to encounter were due less to any deficient capacity on his part than to the circumstances that he took upon himself too much work for a single man. From what we have said, it would be readily understood that he was good natured to a fault and that he was thoroughly and sincerely beloved by those who had the advantage of his private friendship. Um, and I'm not too, I haven't figured out yet what London cemetery he's buried in. So you can see here, he died a few days since in Alexandra Square in Brompton. So he retired to, to Brompton in London. 
Um, I do know like there is a cemetery in Brompton in London. He could have been buried in the magnificent cemetery, Victorian cemeteries in London. And I did do a search on his nearest cemetery and he does, he's not coming up. Uh, and even there are people that have written that he is buried in a certain cemetery and I haven't come across his name yet. So there's work there to be done um, as well. And just to conclude, um, I do realize that was um, an epic journey, um, but we're dealing with a man here that I suppose does, his work does deserve to be um, celebrated. It's probably the first time since the 1870s that his large body of work maybe has been brought into one place. And as I'm, I mean, as I went through some of this, I mean, you could go off on tangents and tell the story more of all these buildings. And there are different pieces of a puzzle that are I've collected, but are st they're still out there. I think the digitization of archives and records have certainly helped me put this put together this presentation. Um, and certainly he's a huge impact into the industrial memory and archaeological memory and architectural memory of the city. Um, this, he's, he is in huge need of further study. He is one of the pioneers in modernizing Cork and John's work is still very relevant today. Um, and I suppose still very apt. I mean, we still talk of, we, we, I mentioned like the, the waterworks, um, the roads, and I mentioned like the, the trains and uh, people kind of commuting and so on. And they're all things that have also, there are, are question marks and they are challenges as well for Cork of, I suppose the future and even the emerging new city development plan, and which will be published in full um, next um, year. And also, I just I wanted to plug um, a book I brought out during the year called Cork City Reflections. It is interesting, like that many of the old postcards from 100 years ago, they showcase John Benson's work. Um, and anyone who anybody who comes into Cork to, to take photographs of Cork usually ends up taking photographs of John Benson's work works as well. And long may that actually happen. So that 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 that's me. Um, my thanks, Aoife, um, for your patience and to the people who are still listening uh, to the presentation. Um, I'll, and I'll stop sharing. I'm in the dark a little bit there. Yeah, I think we're, we're back on. So we are there, Kieran. What that was fascinating. Um, what an amazing man he was. Um, the amount of buildings he touched in the city and all kinds of across from waterworks to bridges to rail to the exhibition center like he just touched incredible buildings he just was an amazing character we have a few questions which i'm going to run through here so i am so the first one is from finbar long in the 1990s i heard that the late brian o'sullivan then harbor engineer for chc was compiling documentation on john benson's projects and schemes in cork city and harbor does anybody know anything about this um, that I don't know. Um, if, it, if there was something compiled, it wasn't handed into library or archives or museum. Um, I have no doubt that somebody has done something way back in time. Um, I mean, I've, I came across a lot of newspaper articles in the Examiner in the 1970s, for example, on his work. Um, but again, uh, yeah, I'd be very intrigued to see any of, uh, of late Brian O'Sullivan's work. If someone's on the call, um, please send me an email at some point. I'd, I'd love to see it um, to dig in more. Excellent. I've just shared your email there if anybody wants to get in contact. Um, the next one is from the Crawford Gallery. Just to say thanks to the Val Ethan Kieran from the Friends Office, which is still in the original part of the Custom House in Emma Place. Wonderful to see a feature in Samuel McDonald's painting from 1855, which is in our collection today. Think it's all better yeah. here. Yeah, I mean, go to I mean, say to go to the Crawford Art Gallery as well. I mean, we're very, very blessed between art gallery, library, museum, archives. That we've got different lenses to look at how Cork developed through time. Um, so it actually is great to it's great to see a, a splicing of Engineers Ireland, Cork, and the art, the friends of the Crawford this evening, uh, which is which 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 is which is fantastic. Um, we need to do more of that sort of cross disciplinary work uh, and elements like that as well. Absolutely. It's a lovely, it's a lovely mix there. So it is. John Doyle asks, so sorry, was the Cork Exhibition Centre located where the City Hall is now? Yeah. So, um, so basically what happened is that, yeah, there was a corn market on the site, then it was a Cork National Exhibition. The exhibition closed, they moved the Southern Hall, the, the Athenium, uh, and basically went back to being a corn market. And then in 1890s, um, City Hall actually took, up, took over space on the first floor level of the old corn market and eventually took over the second, the, the ground floor level. And basically the corn market um, dissipated. Um, it I think it, it moved somewhere else um, and basically became known as Cork City Hall. And that was the building then that was actually burned down in 1920 uh, and then was rebuilt into what we see today, in 19 opened in 1936, the City Hall of today. Um, so again, there's all these nuances and layers and what happened to all these buildings and all these kind of different stories. Um, 
but 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 yeah i mean if you go looking for the yard i mean the southern hall that john benson was involved with if you go looking for that today it's the concert hall of cork city hall which is still a, also a very beautiful space today Excellent. Thank you very much. Garvin asked, did he ever sleep? <laughs> Which I think is a fair question. No, I don't. I don't think so. And I, I think he took criticism to heart as well. I think he, I, my, my, yeah, I mean, it'd be great if John Benson was on the call. He'd probably be a completely different person to what we actually think. But I think from my, just my reading of his, of his speeches, we're very, very lucky that, like, again, as I say, the examiner is digitized going back and you can read his speeches and his reactions to people. You just pull no punches, just call a spade a spade. He was quite frank with people um yeah absolutely john doyle asks where was cork's main train station before the tunnel to kent station was built please uh kilberry um but the thing is the buildings are long gone so before you come into if you're ever on the cork dublin train and you're just about to enter the tunnel on the left is a series of platforms and there were buildings there um but they're all gone but it, there is there is a plan for the future in uh I suppose mapping the, the the rail network of Cork in the future that that station is going to reopen in Kilbarry, or they're basically going to have to build a new railway station in Kilbarry, uh, in a nutshell. Um, and interesting, like when before you go into the tunnel um, from Ken Station side, if you look up, you'll actually see 1855 actually written on the top of the tunnel. Uh, and of course, the tunnel also like they had there was a dynamite explosion that killed people. It has its own story as well. They also built a tunnel underneath like houses in Montanati and St Luke's. So when they were blasting, all the houses was a broken glass and people were brought to court and there was like funnels constructed and like there's actually a whole talk on actually railways of Cork and how they how, how people got on with the railway lines and the nuisance with that so when I say to you like John Benson was involved in that I mean he also had to cope with locals going hold on a second um I, you, you can't put a tunnel underneath my house um and, and elements like that I mean I've walking tours of um um, old Yall Road up by Collins Barracks and there's an old funnel up there and we go through all of that in the walking tours. So hopefully my walking tours will be back as well for next year. Sounds great, yeah, I'd love to do one of those for sure. And John Coleman says, wonderful talk. John Coleman is from Sligo and more than happy to provide contacts locally on his origins, etc. So that might, might be... Yeah, John Coleman, can you please email me? <laughs> Uh, email in there so he is so anybody wants it it's, it's in the chat box so it is yeah can someone can someone on the on the committee just take that out copy and paste that and send it to me there please john thanks very much very good um garvin asks what happened to the magnificent structure at the rds how long did it survive after the exhibition yeah i mean these are all like six month projects they're all, all these things were taken down um, or they were removed, like parts of the Cork National Exhibition became the Athenaeum. I'm not too sure. I, my, my knowledge of the Dublin International Exhibition is, is, is limited, I have to say. Um, but I do know things like, I mean, there was another exhibition held in Cork in 1883 on the site of the corn market again. Um, and then they decided to move away from the corn market in 1902 and 1903, and they went to the Mardyke and did a huge exhibition there and, uh, with prefabricated plaster instead of like timber and iron and glass. Um, and there was also an exhibition on, this, on the Carragherhan Strait Road in 1932, um, which was actually timber chalets and timber huts and, uh, and things like that. Um, so again, there, there, there's legacies, but like to be honest, many of these exhibitions after six months ended and things were just taken down. No, oh, amazing. John O'Gorman asks, a fantastic piece of history and so well put together. Is there an opportunity to do some further work on his Sligo background? So I think you guys with John Coleman and John O'Gorman and yourself, Karen, there's a job. There. Yeah, I, I need to do the Wild Atlantic Way next summer and take the old scooter motorcycle up to Sligo um, or take the train to Sligo uh, and get a sense. Um, I do know if I was looking at Google Earth of Kaluni um, Village today and I, I can see that it's, 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 it's really changed since John Benson's time with the old... Um, bleach mills are still there the ruins of so yeah i need to get it um, as i say i need to get that that's the one email i need from tonight's presentation to piece together uh, yeah some of his influences uh, and to get a tour of some of his influences as well because they do echo right throughout his career definitely that sounds great lorraine asks is there any street named after john benson in cork he has such an impact on the city but does not seem to be well known no no um and like most architects and engineers there are no streets named after them either um, they're usually named after kings or queens or rich merchants in the city um, yeah i know that there's an ongoing conversation in in uh, cork city council on the renaming of streets um, especially as we go through this kind of commemorating the war of independence from 100 years ago um, but yeah, there, I mean, they're probably, I mean, I think the great, one of the greatest legacies that John Benson is the old Cork Waterworks experience. 
um, like here is an interactive museum um, exhibition for kids and families. Go and see it and take the tour uh, and do and see what they've actually built up there and, and their ongoing work. And there's also science workshops with kids. And it's really, really, and Cork City Council run it. And it's, I think that's probably one of the greatest legacies to John's work that it's for the public good, it's for the common good. Um, I think that that's probably one of his greatest legacies that's in the present day, uh, apart from Irish water digging up the castor and water uh, pipes and things like that. Um, no problem. There's one last question. Was there any hotels in Cork City built to accommodate the railway, like the Great Southern Hotels? Yeah, yeah, there would have been loads of, um, I mean, if you, if you think about the Metropole Hotel, it opened in 1897. I mean, you had the Imperial Hotel, um, which opened in, uh, I think, 1817 onwards and um, it was originally owned by the Cork Chamber of Commerce um, and it was opened as this kind of like commercial hotel where if you were a traveling tradesman you actually stayed so man and we were very very lucky as well like the street director we have street directors of the city going back to 1830s um, and they, you can you can you can map where all the hotels were and I mean those street directories physically are in local studies in the city library are they were online I think Cork City Library are revamping their local studies website at the moment and and in the new year coming forward with a brand new website um, show that where you'll be able to download a free PDF and, and all of these different things. So we were very, very blessed with the amount of information that you can now get access to. So people who were, who were researching maybe John Benson 30, 40 years ago, really had to thrall through newspapers. I think what I presented to you today, probably to put together would have, would have taken two years, we say 30 years ago in terms of different libraries and elements like that, where there is now so much stuff online where we, one can do from your living room. Um, so two years to two and a half months to put something together um but yeah well there's another question after coming in here there from john Dull. would there be a talk on railways of cork i think that could be <laughs> <laughs> oh a chat to engineers cork for next year um <laughs> engineers ireland cork um but i mean i i need i mean it's probably that's a nice link just to thank engineers ireland cork branch for their interest in the history of engineering in uh, history of engineering and architecture in the city and for all the work done um, and, been, and happy 80th birthday as well um because i i suppose we're all the present day work kind of going forward um is built on people like john benson and his ideas and it's great to see new young generations going through i mean what's i suppose i i also described a very male dominated world and but we're very very blessed in cork today that it's male and female world um, when it comes to kind of engineering Cork at the present day. And I think that's actually really important to note that. Um, yeah, so. No, that's great. So it is. We really enjoy it. There's certainly a book in it, so there is, Kieran. So I think that's a nice basis of research to get you started on it anyway. Um, I will put you on. I'll close up. I'll, sorry. I'm going to go to Rona now. So we are for just the closing few words. I think we've gone through all the questions. So now I just want to thank you for a wonderful lecture. It was excellent. Hi, Kieran. Um, I think uh, uh, if you beat me to the, to the punchline there, I was going to ask you when, when the uh, biography is coming out, um, how long we have to wait for it. Um, and, and Sir John Benson. Um, so look, just as, as a vote of thanks, um, you know, absolutely excellent lecture. And, you know, on behalf of, of Engineers Ireland, Cork Region, the committee, uh, our membership, the audience tonight, um, our, our co-hosts and the, the, the friends of the, the Crawford, um, I'd just like to thank you once again for what was an absolutely um, wonderful and engaging lecture, um, as was other, other lectures you've done for us and, and, and other times this you know for example the, the walking tours and that um your sense of engagement and interest in the actual topic comes across and it's 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 great it's it's it, it really enlivens the um the, the, the presentations so um i'd like to thank you once again very very much for for for, for an excellent